Hello, everyone, and welcome to Reflections on Elections, the role of the media at the ballot box. This is the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum, and I'm Sarah Kelly. Today, we're talking about the role that the media plays in democracy and elections. American voters will head to the polls next week, with much at stake for the future direction of the country. Elsewhere around the globe, there are also elections being held, and the democratic process is being challenged as the tension between populist movements and pluralist voices grows. Let's have a look. Reflections on elections. The role of the media at the ballot box. Welcome to the eighth online session of the Global Media Forum. Free elections. They're considered the cornerstones of democracy. What role do the media play in elections? How independently do they interact with politics and with politicians? How independently can they inform the voters? Fueled by the COVID-19 pandemic, more and more people mistrust the political system. And they believe the media have their own agenda. What relationship is there between this conviction and the increasing electoral success of populists? What can media professionals do to change these beliefs? Join our discussion. Welcome back. This is the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum session, Reflections on Elections, the role of the media at the ballot box. If you are watching via Facebook Live, please do feel free to get involved in the conversation. You can leave your questions in the comments section. I will be sure to ask as many of them as possible. Please, without any further ado, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel. We have leading perspectives from the U.S., Europe, South America, and Applebaum is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, journalist, and commentator on geopolitics. She is staff writer at The Atlantic and a senior fellow at the Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Isabella Oliveira Khalil is professor at the Foundation School of Sociology and Politics of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Her work examines the role of gender in politics, focusing on Latin America. And Ellen Eni is editor-in-chief of the German public broadcaster WDR Television. She has previously worked as a reporter and an editor for various news and current affairs formats across the country. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And Anne, I'd like to begin with you because um, you recently published a book, Twilight of Democracy. The U.S. is one of the cases that you highlight in that book, a country where there is increasing polarization, where there is a president that has displayed authoritarian tendencies. Um, I'd like to talk about the media's role in helping to facilitate strong and stable democracies. But first, perhaps you can just set the stage for us. How do you see the state of democracy right now in the U.S. as we head into the election next week? So if you think about it, democracy is in some ways inimical to some part of human nature. Um, what it requires is that when you win an election, you have to keep in place all of the elements of the political process that will enable your political enemies to win again in four years' time or five years' time. Um, and if you lose an election, you have to accept that your political enemies have the right to rule. Um, although you know that you will have uh, the tools with which to compete against them um, in the future. What we've seen, uh, in, not just in Europe and not just in the United States, but actually all over the world, is the, is the rise uh, of political parties who don't want to accept that bargain. In other words, who want to come to power and change the rules to make it harder for others to leave and they have uh, to win next time. And they have various reasons why they believe they can make this argument. Some because, you know, we represent the real people, the true people, our enemies represent foreigners or elites or, or, or people who aren't true Brazilians or true Poles or true, true Americans. Um, and one of the primary things that they do is they seek to undermine the media. Um, and this is done in different ways. It's done um, through discrediting, you know, simply, you know, it's all fake news, it's not true, so that the media can't hold leaders to account. Sometimes it's done through um, attempting to undermine ownership structures. This is what happened in Hungary. It may happen in Poland as well. Sometimes it's done through assault on state media in countries that have that. Um, sometimes there are other techniques and tactics, but it all has the same goal, which is to eliminate the the competition of voices and the and the and and political debate. Um, the internet, unfortunately, um, has not 
helped that. It's made it easier for um, those kinds of political parties and those kinds of political leaders um, to make their case in, in and, 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 to, and to divide societies uh, because it's now possible to read only one set of news that comes from your party or your political grouping. Um, and the, the, I mean, the solution to this, which I'm sure we'll get to, um, has to uh, has to involve a number of changes, both in the way the media works and also in the way uh, the internet works. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to get a, a check now on, on what is going on in Brazil, because we see a lot of those trends at play also in Brazil, where Isabella is standing by for us. Um, Isabel, we know in your country, President Jair Bolsonaro wrote, rose to power two years ago with his brand of strongman populist politics. You study conservative movements in the country. Your work documented some of the methods that he used to do so, including, as Anne mentioned, undermining the free press, the truth, targeting division among among the population. Walk us through what you observed. So uh, this is a good question because in Brazil, after the, the end of the dictatorship, we used to have um, like a, something that we could believe that te television, TV used to be central during the elections. And uh, in this uh, 2018 election, was a shift, we had a shift of paradigm, because for the first time, social media and WhatsApp uh, represented the most important element in terms of media, most than uh, television, for example. So in that case, in Brazil, Oh, apologies, everyone. It seems we have some technical difficulties there. Um, we'll try and get Isabella back in just a moment. But Ellen, you're standing by. Um, as we mentioned in your introduction, you're the head of Germany's largest regional public broadcaster. It's a country where there is a strong tradition of public media. Um, but we have to mention that in the last election, a right-wing party, the AFD, entered the parliament for the first time since World War II. This party, they call you the lying press. How is that influencing the work that you are doing? Well, it's terrible for us to be called this way because this is a term that used to be uh, that was used by the Nazi regime in the uh, in the 1930s in Germany. And lie press is the press that followed uh, uh, the Nazi regime, um, and um, which is completely uh, 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 difficult for us to 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 listen to something like that. I want to connect to what Anne just said. She said it's like a course of eliminating the competition of voices. I think that. It's something that, that the AFD, as you just mentioned, tries to do as well, because our role as a public broadcaster is to really be there for a diversity of opinions. We need to listen to everybody. That is our um, uh, fate. We, that's our job, by the way. And we need to not only listen to those that we like, but we have to represent all of the opinions that exist in Germany that is different from, for example, press releases in Germany. You can be, there can be a, a, a newspaper that can be on the left and another one on the right, but we have to be there for everybody. The problem is that the AFD um, um, actually attacks us, telling, yeah, well, you're financed by state, so you only um, try to report what Angela Merkel wants, and uh, she dictates you what you have to write and what you have to, to print and, diffuse it and, and uh, broadcast. But that's not true at all. We are completely independent. We are paid by um, uh, public uh, funding. Everybody has to pay uh, a TV fee, and uh, we um, only um, depend on advertising it just a little bit and we are very our independence is very important to us i know we need to struggle to show that we're there for everybody um, but that's more or less i think a diversity problem because we ourselves as journalists are mostly well educated we're um, mostly white and uh, we're perhaps in danger of losing contact to the rest of the population. And that's the, 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 the aim I'm working on a lot, not to really lose the contact to those people who are perhaps a little bit uh, well situated than myself. I try really to, to listen to everybody and to show them we are not a liar press, but we are there for everybody and that's our damn job.
Um, and something that I'd like to, to ask you about, um, you touched on it on your first answer, but it's really so critical. So I'd just like you to elaborate and, and underscore its importance, because we mentioned that free elections are considered the cornerstones of democracy, with the media often described as the fourth estate. Um, before we talk about the state of trust in the media right now around the world, walk us through why reliable media, a common understanding of facts and the truth are so important and critical for a healthy public, public discourse and for democracy. So what every democracy needs in order to survive and to thrive, and, and, and different democracies have found different solutions to this, is some kind of public sphere. So some kind of public forum where people can argue issues out um, and where, by the way, extreme views can be filtered out. And this has always also been part of um, the role of the media and before it, um, the role of public fora and, in, and, and, and in life events as well. Um, but there needs to be some kind of public forum in which the rules are agreed and which everybody has accepted the rules of the constitution or the rules of the democracy. Um, and everybody who, who accepts those rules is, is allowed to speak and, and can be heard. Um, you know, in proportion to, to their to how much support they have, um, some countries um, and Germany actually is one of them. Um, Britain is one of them. Are lucky enough to have state media, uh, public media, that has enough. You know, that have that is that is run by rules that mandate um, objectivity and mandate that you know the different parties get voices, um, and that at least strive. To, to portray a wide range of public opinion and strive to be the place where the democratic debate can, can happen. Um, not all democracies are so lucky. Many of them either don't have public media, like the US doesn't have it, um, or, they ha or it's been captured by one party or another, or else it's very weak, which is also the case. Um, in some places, and then and then and then those democracies are reliant on private media. Um, private media in the last uh, couple of decades has lost its business model, um, and so private media has gone from being able to having a business model which actually required you know mainstream newspapers, so-called mainstream newspapers and mainstream broadcasters, to reach out to a wide range of people. That was their advertising model. They just wanted to reach as many people as possible. Um, that that model has now collapsed. Um, much of the advertising market has been taken by social media platforms, um, and instead, many private um, private media are. Um, their business model now requires that they speak to much narrower groups. You know, they need to become the paper of the right or the paper of the left or the paper of the wealthy, um, depending on the society. I don't, I don't want to make too many generalizations. Um, and this means that the public sphere has become much more divided. Um, and there is, in many countries, as I said, a lack of a commonly accepted sort of place where you can have a conversation. I mean, in the US, the US is probably the worst in this regard. You know, we have a very polarized political system. We have very polarized media. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, there, there's Fox News, which will not have liberals speaking on it. And there is, um, you know, there's CNN in which it's very difficult to find certain kinds of right wing views. So, so we don't, we simply don't have good fora for, for, for public discussion. And without that, democracy becomes very difficult um, because what democracy depends on is that the main political forces, as I said, respect the rules and also have some kind of inherent respect for one another's views, some acceptance that other people's views are legitimate. Um, and that is slowly being lost uh, in a world where only we are right and only we have, um, you know, only we are, we represent the true nation and, and our enemies, as I say, are foreigners or. Or, you know, or traders, then it becomes um, democracy itself becomes difficult to maintain. And amid that fragmentation, amid that uh, questioning of the truth, that polarization that you've highlighted there, um, I'd just like to, to now walk our viewers through. Um, we can now go to trust in reliable media right now. Um, we have some views from around the world. Let's have a listen. I don't listen to the media. I go on and look at statistics and facts and educate myself, unlike other people who are not knowledge and don't do that and go off of what media says because the media is biased. It's either to the right or to the left really far. Like it's not really, it's, it's, it's just, it's not, it's pretty biased. 
And I have learned not to trust one single source, so it's always best to have multiple ideas and not just believe in the first thing that I see, because it's mostly about the propaganda anyways. You don't judge a book by its cover, because sometimes what we see in the media might not actually be what's going on. But I'll tell you, yes, it really does influence voting. And to a lot of people, to common people, what they see from the media is what it is, whether it is true or it is not. So the power of the media in influencing the decision of voters or who they vote in, you know, it's a place that you cannot take away from the media. But I see what the media has done in the US as well as in the Indian elections and they've really not just influenced, I think they've decided who, who, who is going to get into power. takip etmiyorum aslında. Genelde televizyon seyretmiyorum çünkü. Ama sosyal medyayı takip ediyorum. Ve e, özellikle parti başkanlarının paylaşımları benim tercihimi etkiliyor. Yani YouTube ya тоже не всему доверяю. То есть очень большая фильтрация идёт. Я сравниваю информацию, потом делаю же выводы. И понимаю, конечно, что по телевидению нашему, ну, они всё равно какой-то пиар у них идёт. So some diverse perspectives there on trust in the media. And I'd just like to bring in some polling data. Um, and Anna, uh, I'd like to ask you about this because this was a global survey from Ipsos which found that trust in traditional media is perceived to have decreased over the past five years. It showed two of the main contributing factors are the prevalence of fake news and doubts about media sources' good intentions. What's behind the trend? Well, I so, don't know. Sorry, did you ask me or and <laughs> Please, Alan, go ahead. Uh, sorry, yes. Um, I, I don't know about these Ipsos figures. Um, I can just relate to uh, German um, um, numbers that I have because we work together with another um, institute called Infratest DMAP. And they recently, over the years, they always ask how much uh, confidence do you have or trust do you have into uh, media. Um, it's a good, pretty good uh, number. It says like 67% uh, of the Germans trust the media in general. And uh, specifically, uh, the public television is trusted by 82% of the people during the corona crisis for information to that. But I have to admit, because I, th I see a trend that people just, as you showed in the report, say, oh, media is biased and I get my information where I want it and then I make my own um, picture. I think we kind of participate in polarization and just describe why the United States are so polarized. But even here in Europe, we go towards us versus them. And what, what role does the media play into it? Well, yes, we listen to those who are very loud. We listen to those who are provocative and those where you can say, oh, here's the one opinion and here's the other opinion. And then that gets it more exciting and thrilling to talk about a topic. So the media themselves and this is something that I really want to uh, try to work on with my employees. We need to listen to the silent, those who are not loud, those, those who are not down the street saying, well, I don't wear a mask because Corona doesn't exist. There's 80% of the German people so far, like actual polls show, they think that the measures we took are, um, are, are correct or even need to go further. So there's a great back, back, backing of all these measures that have been taken. But we also, we, we spot those people who, like in Berlin, who ran up the stairs of the Reichstag with uh, the, the, the Reichskriegsflagge from former times, Nazi times in Germany. And we watch these people very closely, although a majority of Germans are reasonable and say, well, now we need to, we need to stay reasonable, we need to wear a mask. And it's our job to show the silent um, medium middle because they are not heard enough in these polarized societies, I think. And I'm curious what your view is and, and what, what you're seeing in, in your work on, um, on what Ellen has just mentioned and also on the results of this, uh, this poll that I mentioned, which, which cited the prevalence of fake news, doubts about media sources, good intentions when it comes to eroding trust in the past years. Why is this happening? So, 
I'm going to be a little bit contrarian and say that the, the 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 woman who was interviewed in one of the in one of the clips you just played, who said, "I need to consult a lot of different sources before I make up my mind," is absolutely right. Um, so even this expression, the media means a lot of things. I mean, the media is right-wing media, it's left-wing media, it's um, it's WhatsApp groups, it's, um, you know, it's online, it's offline, it's, you know, there, there are many different kinds of media. Um, and for citizens to, you know, to, you, know to, you know, the idea that you would just automatically trust it, whatever, however it is that you define it, um, would, of course, be a mistake. Um, and, you know, of course, there's a huge range of media. There is sensationalist you know, 24-hour news, which which responds to whatever was the latest, you know, um, I don't know, celebrity activity. Um, and then there is thoughtful, um, there's quite a lot of thoughtful journalism out there, some from traditional sources, some not. Um, you know, a, a lot of people I know are now reading, uh, you can now subscribe to the work of individual journalists in some, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a form of social media where you can, you can listen to particular people whom you find interesting or who you trust. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to listen to and to, and to use the media. And it really is now incumbent upon citizens much more so than ever to be educated about which media are good and which are not. Um, to 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 look at what kind of media uses, you know, how do they use sources? Do they use quotations? Do they use, you know, more than one source for a story? Do they print corrections? Um, you know, I mean, look, looking, look, making sure you know what it is that you're reading and what are the methods that are being used to write the stories, I think is absolutely necessary. Um, from the other side, I would say that, of course, it's up to journalists to, and, and media companies to try and build relationships with their readers and their watchers. Um, um, and I also think that, that you know, they, we need to expand a little bit the idea of what this means. Um, it, you know, it's, it's not just enough to, to print stories every day. You also have to think about um, uh, you, you know, you have to think about building long-term relationships with people who you want to have subscribed to your work. So you need to think about high levels of quality and style. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there, you know, there are a lot of different things that now can go into journalism um, in order to, in order to make money out of journalism. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, the clickbait model, you know, gives you one kind of returns, but there's another kind of return that can be obtained from, um, from a little bit deeper work. So, I mean, it, I think it's actually a more, it's a more complicated picture than just to say, is it trustworthy? Is it not trustworthy? I mean, some media is trustworthy, some isn't. Um, it's wise of people um, to, to learn about the media landscape, to learn what good journalism is and to try and follow it, you know, pay for it if you need to um, and, and read it. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for that insight. Um, yeah, you mentioned, you know, um, uh, uh, business models and, and how they have really changed um, for the media over the years and, and also, you know, um, uh, attracting um, eyeballs and, and viewers. So I'd just like to get a closer look also at the digital trends that have been at play here, impacting the media, impacting elections and the way that voters are making their decisions. Have a look. Our world is becoming increasingly digital. This also applies to politics. The idea of an analog election campaign is over. Elections are held and won on social media. Nearly half the world's population currently uses social media. Artificial intelligence, big data and targeted algorithms are influencing our lives more and more each day. As a result of this, elections will also be decided online. Social platforms are giant databases used by politicians like Barack Obama and Donald Trump, who employed millions of user data points to optimize his election campaign. Bespoke marketing messages using so-called micro-targeting and dark ads are fast becoming key to such modern strategies. These are advertisements that are displayed to individual Facebook users. Trump's election campaign team invested 38 million US dollars over the past two years in Facebook campaigning alone. And during the 2016 Brexit referendum, the Leave campaign invested 98% of its budget in digital marketing. But there is a real threat behind all this. Populists and demagogues can make strategic use of fake news to destabilize societies and thus garner votes. 
digital technologies are fast becoming a destructive weapon in this political climate. Are politicians becoming the puppets of digital strategists? Or are they the puppeteers? And could anyone who has the necessary funds become president in the future? Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I just want to give you a quick note. Um, we've been trying to get back in touch with Isabella Oliveira Khalil, uh, who was joining us from Sao Paulo, but unfortunately, we haven't been able to reestablish connections. So we're going to continue our conversation um, with Anne Al Applebaum and Ellen Ani. And Anne, I'd like to get your reaction, um, because, uh, of course, there's a lot of positive um, in our digital sphere in, in terms of uses um, and, and what has um, uh, been able to be possible in our world. Um, but in that video, we see some of the negative trends at play, um, including efforts to spread disinformation, to tap into divisions in order to mobilize voters. And when you look at it through, through that lens, um, what are you seeing? Is it all doom and gloom? So, of course, you're absolutely right that digital technology can be used for good or for ill. I mean, it's just technology. I mean, just, just like um, television can be used to, to, to promote, you know, North Korean propaganda or to show a football game. I mean, these are, the, you know, the technology is, is molded by the, the human beings um, who use it. Um, I do think that there are a couple of things about social media in particular, but also the Internet more broadly, though, that are changing the way that we have conversations. Um, one of them is the way that algorithms on Facebook and Twitter and other forms of social media are, and to some extent even Google, or, I mean, certainly YouTube, um, are tuned to, um, to push, push us towards more emotional, more angry, um, uh, more divisive content. Um, the way they're set up, um, it isn't, the things that are favored by the algorithms aren't rational conversations and balanced argument, um, what, we, what, is, what is pushed and what spreads most quickly is, is exactly the opposite, which is divisive content. Um, in the long term, it is this trend which, is so, which has been so damaging to democratic debate. Um, and this is why I've begun to argue, um, as, have, as have others, that in the long term, democracies, hopefully as, a, as, a, as an international coalition, will need to impose some restrictions on how those algorithms work. We need ombudsmen for algorithms. We need some insight into them um, in, in, you know, if we are to maintain um, our democratic political system. So that is, that is of course, um, different. I mean, the other, the other big thing that social media does that traditional media doesn't do is that it enables targeted messaging so that instead of one election campaign slogan that's meant to reach a million people, you know, you can now have 300 different slogans, each one targeted at a, a separate social group. Um, and I do think that the, again, the purveyors of division and anger were the first to really understand how to make that work. Um, and it is now incumbent upon um, centrist, center right, center left, um, liberals, liberal Democrats to learn how to use that technology um, for good. I mean, you know, I do believe that digital campaigning um, can be made to work in positive ways. I mean, you can see examples of it um, around Europe and around the world. Um, and it's also something that media organizations need to understand a lot better as well. What are the, you know, what's the strategy? What are the tactics? What are the ways of reaching um, multiple groups um, to, to, to transmit positive messages instead of negative ones? And given what you just said there, Anne, um, Ellen, I'd like to get your reaction. And perhaps you can look through the lens of the German election that is coming up next year. How big of a concern are disinformation campaigns online potentially influencing the vote in the country? I think we don't have yet the situation as in the United States, just like uh, Anne described it. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's uh, the, the, the digital information and the polarization uh, without any public service trying to provide factual basis to that is really a dangerous situation. We try to go against that in Germany with the public service. But we have to realize that more and more people only get informed uh, via social media, and we just describe what's uh, the difficulty about it. So I see um, if we want to really keep the society together, we need to try to be a guide and a pilot in this like huge ocean of information and disinformation that social media is all about. And so if we really want to, to show we can be the guide in the situation, you know that at our um, outlet you find 
um, this information, this one, this one, this one, and then we want you to have your own opinion. So we really need to, I, I come back to what I already said, we really need to be there for all of the opinions in Germany, for a diversity of opinions. And I come back to the Corona uh, demonstration that we had in Berlin end of August. Uh, they call themselves Querdenker, which means the unconventional thinkers. And so we look very closely at these people and we listen to them and we show what they have to say. But I see an area of conflict as well, because if you listen to everybody, sometimes you lose the factual basis of it. And um, we, as I think uh, Anne would, uh, would be uh, completely dis would completely agree with me, uh, we need to be based on facts and we don't discuss if the moon is made out of cheese or if climate change is human made. I don't discuss that, but I can discuss about the political decisions once we know that climate change is made by humans, we can discuss about the political consequences. But I, I stay based on facts. And facts in Corona times are very difficult. We, we know that the science is just getting there every day, every week. We know more about the this illness and this disease. So I, I, I think that's really our challenge for the future, to be there for every opinion but to stay based on facts and to really separate facts from opinion. That's our job as a, as a good um, journalism institute. And in, in terms of an action in order to, an action plan in order to facilitate that, Anne, I'll turn back to you. Um, you, you touched on that a little bit in your answer about this world of algorithms and, and what is performing better um, it, with these models that we have in the tech sphere. Um, I'd like to ask you what opportunities you see to promote truth, to shore up democratic discourse in these digital spheres. I mean, is it really all just about regulating big tech or is there something else that you can see that might be able to be done? So I wouldn't talk about promoting truth, but I would talk about cre recreating the public sphere, um, you know, recreating the, uh, the space for democratic discourse. Um, and I would say there's, you know, there, there almost all everyone who acts in this in this realm has a role to play. Um, I would begin to regulate, you know, in my, you know, dream, you know, dream. I would begin to regulate social media, and I would do it not country by country, but I would do it as democracies. I would I would create a coalition between Europe and the U.S. and other democracies, Asian democracies, other democracies. Um, who want to think about this together and think about this, by the way, not just about social media, it's about the internet more broadly. Um, how much anonymity do we want there to be? How much transparency do we want there to be? Where websites, you know, should, shouldn't people be able to figure out where websites come from? Shouldn't you know whether you're looking at something that was created in Idaho or in, in, in St. Petersburg and, or Moscow? Um, and so I would I would say from at that level we need a big a broader conversation. Um, of course, it's also incumbent on journalists and actors in the media to find ways of building trust, um, to find ways of I mean it, it looks like the media in the future is going to be subscription based, and so um, finding ways of convincing people that they should pay for what you do um, means you, you know thinking very deeply and lots of newspapers and magazines have begun to do this about what it is that they can offer um, that 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 people will want to, to 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 pay for, which is of course was the was the business model in the past. But again, I, I'll echo something I said a minute ago, which is that I also think it's incumbent on readers and users of social media to understand what are the, what they are doing. I mean, look nowadays. Everyone is a journalist. I mean, everyone on Twitter is a journalist, and everyone on Twitter is an editor. Um, you know, you are making decisions about what to pass on, you know, what to write, what to publish, what to publicize, what to amplify. Um, and you, therefore, have an obligation as a citizen to understand, um, you know, you know what, which kinds of news are better and which are worse and what's a joke and what isn't. Um, and and people need to be educated to think along these lines. I mean, I, I think in future that will become normal. You know, the idea that civic education or um, whatever, whatever you call it in different countries, social studies will also include um, lessons for people to on how to think about um, how to be a responsible user of social media. That's going to have to be a part of what it means to be a good citizen. 
Really, really fascinating stuff. Um, we all have a role to play here. Perhaps that's also a message um, for everyone who is, is viewing that you yourself can actually take action, decide what it is you choose to amplify. Um, I'd just like to go to some rapid fire questions that we've been getting in via Facebook Live. Um, and this is a question to both of you. Um, this is coming from Marcus from the UK, who writes, people do not use media outlets for news gathering anymore, but to affirm their own views and beliefs. Would you agree? Ellen, your answer. <laughs> well, I think he's he's right uh, because um, like digitalized communication, social media um, allows us to stay in our um, self-confirmation biased bubble and um, algorithms always give me what I already know and conform my, um, my opinion. Before you you were in a little in a small village and you talked to your neighbor and you realized oh he doesn't think like me or he thinks like me but you are only the two of us, and now you have like this little village is globally and uh, you have so many people who um, are uh, agreeing with uh, sometimes really nonsense on internet but you can say oh look at all of these people who think the same as I do and I think that's a real danger for our society that needs to be self reflected and it's it's again our role. We are professional journalists. I know out there, there are 100 million journalists now who say something on Twitter or as, as Anne just said, everywhere on social media. But it's our role as journalists uh, to, to say yes, but we, this is our job, we have more competence and more experience to say this is a reliable source. This has not been proven. Um, this is critical or whatever. And we really need to point out that this is our job and it's not our job, job to judge the information. Then we, if we call it opinion if we judge the information, but it's our job to provide facts. And I'm pretty sure that in the future, because people are so lost in social media society where you don't know uh, what's right, what's wrong, that will turn back to quality and turn back to people who really try to care and filter out what's right, what's wrong. And I hope really that the age of alternative facts um, will um, end with uh, perhaps a new president, yes. Okay, and, and your response to this question. Um, people don't use media outlets for news gathering anymore, but just to affirm their own views and beliefs. Would you agree? I mean, is there, is there just too much information out there? So I'm not sure whether the question refers to who people are, whether it refers to the people doing the writing or the people doing the reading. I mean, I think, first of all, media outlets, as I said, is a very wide category. And I think there are a lot of people writing and speaking in different kinds of media who are not just trying to affirm their own opinion, who are trying to present um, objective facts and who are looking for deeper truths. And as you say, the, the um, you know, who are, who are, who are seeking to, to, in a responsible way to inform people. I just don't accept that idea that all journalists are, you know, are, are simply saying their opinions. I mean, some are, you know, and some aren't. Um, w whether people use the media that way um, is a different question. I mean, yes, it's true that in the, um, you know, in the in the era that we live in, people do seem to seek affirmation of what their views are, you know, from social media, from the filter bubbles that they live in. Um, but once again, I, I'm not sure I believe that that's true of everybody. I, I do think that people still um, still listen to, I mean, the, 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 the questioner was coming from the UK. I think people still do turn to the BBC at moments of crisis to find out what's going on and what's happening. Um, I did think that the coronavirus crisis was a moment when Suddenly people said, wait, we want to know what is this disease? We want to understand it. There were hundreds of articles written about what it was, as you were, as, 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 as you were saying there, you know, they've, the, the understanding has evolved with time. Um, there's enormous amount written about the disease and how to deal with it and, and then the conversations about that. And I think you can, you can discover an enormous amount um, online um, or, or in newspapers or on television um, about you know about the coronavirus, and it's an it's a moment when, um, you know, the, you know, it, it brought home to us why sometimes we do need real information. I mean, if you want to survive the virus, you need to know what's true about it and what's not true. Um, and that is a moment when you many people suddenly realize they need to figure out what are the best objective sources to to provide them with that information. 
And that's um, that's interestingly um, something that has impacted your work, Ellen. Um, you mentioned it a little bit earlier that amid the coronavirus pandemic, the level of trust in in German public broadcasters has actually increased. It's been um, one of the the knock on effects of the pandemic because the citizens do feel like they can trust individually the information. So just walk us through how you know covering the pandemic has impacted the work that you do. Well, starting in March, April, we realized that there was really a big demand of uh, our public who wanted to know. Everybody was really not assured about what's going on, how dangerous is this. In the beginning, a lot of people said it's like a flu. Now we know it's a lot more dangerous than a flu. But um, people really, we, we realized how much people went to public service um, information offering. And we did, um, and we uh, starting from end of March, we started a, a everyday show of 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of the most important information. A lot of service provided, a lot of where can I get this and how can I get together with other people and um, perhaps less investigative journalism, but a lot of just being close to people in a very, very difficult situation. And for, for us, as, as a public service network, it was really good to feel that, that people came back to us because they wanted reliable information. And perhaps uh, may I just point out another thing about polarization, because we said that earlier. It's something I'm working on a lot. And I'm wondering why is this us versus them thinking so attractive to people, why it's like us and the, the foreigners and black and white or whatever. I think it's difficult to trace a real dig or a real border these days. We don't have the left wing, right wing stuff. We right. don't have the communist capitalist stuff, but we have perhaps a new dig, a new border that is between people open to change and people who can adapt, uh, adopt uh, easily to a digitized society and to a lot of information and all of that. And we have people that are not open to change and they are, they don't adapt to a digitized society. Mm -hmm. And our, we as journalists, we are a lot on the open-minded side and the, we change all the times. So we look at new people, we look at new situations all the times. So we are, of course, more with these open-minded people. And we, we should not forget that we need to be with those who are afraid of change and those who are completely overwhelmed by, by what's going on right now. Um, and we have an important question coming in from Nigeria. And I'd just like to briefly um, ask you if you could comment on it comment on it. Um, this individual writes, in an emerging democracy where the bulk of the media is owned by politicians and the public media will not air anything that is against the ruling party, how can people have a balanced and objective view of the things happening in a country? So this is absolutely critical and key question in so many democracies, and I really empathize with the questioner. Um, and it's the reason why, um, one of the reasons why the United States is sliding into trouble is that it's becoming, it's in, it's in danger of becoming, of the media becoming corrupt in that way, um, or some part of the media. I'm now, I'm now making the mistake I've criticized others for. I mean, I think the only answer is different forms of, at least at this stage, different forms of citizens' journalism. Um, you know, trying to, you know, essentially crowdfunded journalism and finding ways of, you know, creating media organizations that can build trust with readers, um, you know, avoiding the oligarchs and the politicians. Um, eventually, uh, you know, in the hope is that, that those kinds of uh, those kinds of projects can expand and eventually become money earners and become businesses for themselves. It's there are a couple of examples of that in places where where that's worked, but that's the that's the answer I can give for now. Ellen, um, uh, very brief comments before we, we have to go. And I'd just like to ask you your, your closing thoughts. Um, what is your advice, perhaps an action plan for individuals, for your viewers who are watching out there, um, in terms of how we can all start dealing in facts again and have a healthy public discourse? Well, that's something I would really wish for everybody. I can just tell these people, if you're in a country where the press is not as free or where there's corrupt press, as Anne said, 
try to be critical, try to find other sources, try to find international journalistic projects and try really to, to get to the source, uh, source of an information and then figure out, is this plausible? Is Does that make sense? Or uh, we have to be a lot more awake and a lot more critical than ever before because the world has become so difficult and so complex. And I, I just want to encourage everybody to, to, to keep in mind that stay awake and uh, stay uh, stay. Uh, uh, fresh in your head, otherwise we'll all draw down. And what is your message? Because you wrote recently, um, and I'd just like to quote some of your work, um, you said, we treat democracy like clean water, something that just comes out of the tap, something we exert no effort to procure. What proactive actions do you think that viewers out there should consider taking to help support strong public discourse, strong democratic process? So I've, I've mentioned two or three of them already. Um, one is everybody should remember that everyone is now a journalist and everyone is now a publisher and pe people should be responsible with how they use social media. Um, uh, you know, another is to support newspapers, magazines, television programs, video blogs, um, um, which you find to be quali you know, of quality and fact-based. Um, support them with your money, um, support them by watching them. And, and reading them, um, support citizens' journalism, support you know new projects, new journalistic projects that seek to build trust and 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 produce journalism in in, in new ways. Um, and and remember that being you know democracy is not a thing that falls out of the sky. I mean, it requires public participation. It requires people to be um, to be active citizens, to, to, to take part in elections, to join organizations, to join political parties. Um, it's not a thing that experts can do over in the corner, you know, or in a couple of buildings in your capital city. It is thing that, you know, all of us need to be involved in all of the time. Thank you so much. We have to leave it there. Thank you all for joining us for this Global Media Forum session, Reflections on Elections, the Role of the Media at the Ballot Box. Thank you so much to our distinguished panelists, Anne Applebaum, Ellen Ani, for making the time and joining us today. For Global Media Forum followers, the next session will be on November the 11th on the relationship between journalists and environment reporting in South America. This is organized in partnership with the DW Academy. I'm Sarah Kelly. Thank you so much for watching.